Luke 18. Nothing like losing a kid right before. Mac had mentioned last week that the men's study is this Saturday, and I foolishly corrected him and told him it was next Saturday, and I was very wrong. I emailed him pretty much right away on Sunday night saying I was wrong about that. Um, I was wrong last week. It is this Saturday. It is the 12th for anybody, for all, any men who would like to come or any wife who would like to gently remind their husbands to come. That would be really good. Um, I had asked the speakers to talk on topics that are kind of um, big failing points sometimes in our spiritual life, in our personal life, in our home life. And I had asked some of our normal speakers for the men's study to not speak uh, so that I could choose some of the older, wiser, more experienced men to do so. And I hope that that will be a really good series of lessons, and I hope that um, many of you guys will be uh, encouraged and excited to do that. We're going to look here at Luke 18. We're going to look in verse 18 in just a moment. The Bible is full of great people who we want to be like. Imagine being Joseph, where in any and every circumstance you seem to to meet that circumstance with great aplomb and just on point faith. That'd be, that'd be great. Or to be like Moses, who gets to go into God's presence and talk to him face to face like a friend. That'd be amazing. And as we look at some of those really great people that we want to be like, the Bible is also full of a lot of people that we don't want to be like. And so we're going to spend time today, and we're going to look at just uh, five examples of the Bible gives us of individuals that we don't want to be like. And here in Luke 18, in verse 18, is the first one we want to talk about. Because we know him as the man who is rich and young and is a ruler. So that's what we call him. And so in Luke 18, the ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except for God. Do you know do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, All of these I have kept from my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack, sell all that you have, and give to the poor, that you will have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. This is one of the fastest verses that we get explained away almost immediately. You can't get through uh, verse 23 without someone saying, but we don't have to do this. This is only his command. And that almost makes the entire passage null and void. But I want us to really consider what Jesus is saying in these verses. It isn't about the money. It was never about the money. In fact, that's the whole problem, is that for this man, it was all about the money. That was the thing that his heart provided. That was the first priority in his life. And that's the thing that he had to get rid of. Not a little bit, not a lot, but he had to completely dismantle that in order to serve God properly. But luckily, that's only his command. That's only what he has to do. We don't have to be like that, right? That's exactly the point that we're looking at here, is that here's a man that we don't want to be like. We don't want to be the person who has to give up the thing that is most dear to us in order to serve God. And that's how we view this verse all the time. We go through this passage, well, this command's only for him. This is a one-off thing. This only applies to him. And yet, if we take our time in Matthew 6, back in verse 4, Jesus said, anybody who would come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We don't like the story of the rich young ruler. We don't want to be like him because that story teaches us to give up the thing that is most dear to us in order to make God the most dear to us. And that's hard. And so when we go through the story of the rich young ruler, I don't, I don't want to be like that person. Not the end part where he walked away sad. We just don't want to have to be the person who's commanded to give up what is most dear to us. And luckily, we just don't have to. Tongue in cheek. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20. We've been going through uh, the whole Bible, taking our time each week, going through each book with John, and we got to go through <coughs> Jeremiah a few weeks ago. That's one of the great things about uh, this whole process is we get to spend time in books that we don't always spend a lot of time in. 
And Jeremiah chapter 20, uh, I threw it on my audio book uh, and, and get out, went out and did my work. And listening through it, and I kind of was on pace for most of Jeremiah. And, and that, that is a hard-hitting passage. Consider what he says here in verse 7. Jeremiah says, O oh Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I become a to hold the day, and everyone mocks me. For whatever I speak, I cry out, I shout. Violence and destruction from the word of the Lord has come upon me for reproach and derision all day long. For if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary from holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whisperings and terrors on every side. Denounce him, let us denounce him, says all of my close friends, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived, and, he will over, and we will overcome him, and take our refuge on him. For the Lord took me as a dread warrior, therefore my persecutors will stumble, and they will not overcome me. They will be greatly ashamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous who sees the hearts and the mind. Let me see your vengeance upon them, for you, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of the evildoer. The curse be the day on which I was born, the day when my mother bore me. Let it not be cursed. Curse news to my father, son born you. Me am very glad. Let him be like the cities that the Lord overthrew without pity, and let him cry in the morning and an alarm at noon, because he did not kill me in the womb, so my mother would have been, been my grave, and her womb forever great. Why did I come out from the womb to see the toil and sorrow and to spend my days? <coughs> when it comes to people we don't want to be like, doesn't chapter 20 hit you as a chapter of this is a kind of a person I don't want to be like? To, to have that relationship with God in verse 7, that you have deceived me, and that you were greater than I, and you have prevailed. That God has so ruled your life. But later on, to have all your friends become the terror on every side, waiting for your downfall. Or to think in verse 14, that the day that you were born should be a curse. Or to wonder why I had been born in the first place. I don't want to have that feeling. I don't want to have that relationship. I don't want to have to go through those things. And luckily, that's just Jeremiah. That's just the things that he has to suffer through. Luckily, that isn't me. I don't have to be like that at all. But go to Matthew chapter 5. We had looked at this a couple weeks ago. And maybe we should have spent more time in Jeremiah when we went through Matthew chapter 5, but we didn't, so I get to do it now. In Matthew chapter 5, we'll, we'll read verse 10 and verse 11 right at the end of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who persecuted for the righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Whenever you read verse 12, I think Jeremiah chapter 20 should come and pop to the front of your mind that they persecuted the, your, the prophets who were for you. Jeremiah is kind of hidden. We can see that both Peter and here in Matthew when Jesus speaks to the prophets being persecuted, that they had been a reproach. As you go through the prophets, sometimes you don't read that much about it. You see that they're derided, you see that they're rejected. But it doesn't spend a lot of time on the prophets themselves and the suffering they go through. But we get little inklings like this in Jeremiah chapter 20 and Matthew chapter 5. And he tells us to rejoice when that happens to us. We look at Jeremiah. I don't want to be like Jeremiah. It would be great if God spoke to me. It would be great if I had this, this hand-given mission in life that was just singled out solely for that. That would be wonderful. But I don't want to have to go through what he went through. And yet, at the very beginning of the gospel, Jesus tells us, blessed are you when others put you through the same things. When they revile and they 
persecute you, and they utter all kinds of evil falsely against you. Blessed are you. Those are, are huge words to swallow. So if we're going to really take on the mantle of discipleship, and we want to look at individuals to be like it, so I want to be like them, Jeremiah's got to be on the list. And it's not the idea that I want to have to go through all the things that he went through, but I want the blessings that God is able to give through those things. I want to be someone who is constantly pointing others back to God, even if I am reviled. Even if I'm persecuted. Jeremiah is definitely a person we should want to be like, even if we don't want to be like him sometimes. How about Luke chapter 18 again? We had jumped right to verse 18, but I want to back up in Luke 18, back in verse 9. Luke 18, there in verse 9, is, is a story of, of two people, both of which we don't want to be like. Is there in verse 9, he told this parable of some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So two men with the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners or unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. For I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, will not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his chest, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. It is obvious in verse 11 that we don't want to be like the first guy. We don't want to be like the other guy who, who looks down on other people and treats them with contempt because I'm such a great person. But if we're really honest with ourselves, we don't really want to be verse 13 either. We don't really want to be the tax collector. I don't want to have a relationship where I don't my identity, that I look down on them. I don't, I don't want to have that relationship. I don't want to have the relationship when I come in to the assembly that I'm weeping, and I feel ashamed, and I feel lonely. I don't, I don't want that. I want to come in, and I want to meet, greet everyone as equals, and I want to be upbeat, and I want to give this really great facade for how great my week's been, even if it's been terrible. I really don't want to be like the Pharisee, but I don't want to be like the tax collector either. So those are the truth is Sometimes that's exactly how we ought to be in verse 13. Not willing to cast our eyes to heaven and to beat our chest, realizing that we are sinners. Because here in verse 14, that's the whole key. That's the ticket. I say to you, this man went to his home justified. More than the facade, more than greeting others with equal, and more than just coming here and being uplifted. Sometimes I need to be justified. Sometimes my humility is through, and it's rubble you show through. And while I don't want to be like the tax collector, sometimes that's exactly who I need to be like. How about uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is a passage we know, I think, fairly well. I did a Google search a couple years ago um, just on all the physical attributes or all the physical suffering that Jesus went through on the cross. The very first thing that popped up was actually 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I don't think the person who wrote the article read, the, read this verse. Uh, this is all the sufferings of Paul. And as we know, Paul wrote this well before his last, the end of his third journey, and so he still had more imprisonments, more beatings, more shipwrecks. But the list that he gives here, in verse 24, five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked, and a night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, and dangers from rivers, and dangers from robbers, and dangers from my own people, and dangers from the Gentiles, and dangers in the city, and dangers in the wilderness, and dangers in the heart, or dangers in the sea, dangers from false 
Paul's brethren, in toil and in hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and in thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, the daily <coughs> pressures of me and my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? Am I not weak? Who is made to fall, and am I not indignant? The question's been asked several times. Do you think that Paul knew what he was going to go through? And if he knew what he was going to go through uh, whenever Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, would he still go through it? And in Acts chapter 9, Jesus makes the point that I am going to show him all that he is going to suffer for my name's sake. I don't know how detailed that is, but he knew that he was going to suffer. And when we look at people that we want to be like, Paul is definitely not one of them. I mean, if you look at this, this kind of covers the whole gamut of the things that we're afraid of, uh, whether it's um, hunger or thirst, uh, whether it's water. Like, I don't particularly care for deep water. That's just never been a thing that I enjoy. Yet my parents love water activities, so guess what I got to be terrified with every single summer of my childhood? That. But he mentions he was shipwrecked multiple times, and a whole day and a night adrift at sea. Maybe you're afraid of big cities and you get that nervous feeling in big crowds. Listen, I was in dangerous in cities. Maybe it's the, the idea of your own people turning against you. You hate the, that idea. He said he was in danger from his own people. Maybe we hate the idea of traveling a lot, frequent journeys. Whatever it is that kind of seems to be kind of the thing that we hate, Paul gives us kind of a conclusive list of all of these things are the things that he went through in multiple times. I don't want to if you go back a couple pages in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, Paul phrases it like this in verses 11 through 13. 1 Corinthians 4, 11 through 13. He says, To the present hour we hunger and we thirst. We are poorly dressed and we are buffeted and we last when persecuted we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become, and still are, like the scum of the world and the refuse of all things. I don't want to feel like that. I don't want to feel that I'm the scum of the world. I don't want to be treated like the refuse of all things. I don't want to enter into a town and have my reputation perceive me in a really, really negative way where they want, they're, they're going to want to stone me. That's not who I want to be like. And yet, when we think of people who we really want to be like, Paul is usually second notch. Like, the people that we want to be with, I want to be like Paul. I want to have faith, and I want to have courage. I want to have the boldness to speak. I want to be able to, to confront people. And I want to be able to, you can just name the list of all the things you want to be, and Paul seems to kind of run that gamut of all those things you want to be like. Have you ever considered that Paul that way? Through the shipwrecks, and through the tired and the, hum and the hungry nights. And he got to endure all that because he became like the scum of the world and the refuse of all things. Sometimes I want all the blessings. I want all the great aspects of my life. I want to be that kind of a person without having to go through the journey that gets me there. There's a reason over in James chapter 1 there in verse 2. He says, count all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfast. One said, fast as have you let us run its course. It makes you perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. Peter talks about us being refined by fire, that there is a process that we go through. But I don't want to go through the process. I just want to have the result. And what we consider, I don't want to, I'm going to be like this person, but to get there, I don't want to pay the price. Sometimes we put a price on our Christianity. What is it that I'm willing to suffer through in order to get to be that kind of person that I ought to be? And we, we sell ourselves really short. My comfort, my, my feelings, my happiness, my momentary uh, physical benefits, whatever it happens to be, that, that is going to be a low, low price to pay for becoming a spiritual person we ought to be. So we look at Paul, and I want to be just like Paul, but I want to be nothing like Paul. And that's how oftentimes we live. Turn with me over to Matthew 16. The last one. The last person that we look at, and I don't, I don't want to be like that person in a very negative way, is Jesus. I want to really consider this. He was homeless. Homeless. 
feel like I need to repeat that a couple of poems. What is one of the scariest feelings that, that you have? Being late on your mortgage? I, that's, we rented all this all these years and only last year and a half we had a mortgage. That was our mortgage. Oh, every month, oh, we had to be right on time. And the idea of missing that or not having enough money, that's always nagging in the back of my mind. But imagine actually being homeless. How about being hated by the ones that you love the most? John chapter 1 says that he came to his own, and his own knew him not. That it was his priests, it was his uh, scribes that crucified him on the cross. Imagine being hated everywhere you go. How about being in such turmoil where you pray all night, and sometimes being in such turmoil that you're Sweat becomes like blood. It's hard, isn't it? How about having a horrible death at a really young age? When we talk about the tragedies of life, we always talk about people who were taken too soon. 33-ish? Maybe 35-ish? That is a really young life. Do you want to have a life like that? where you were a traveling itinerant teacher, homeless and rejected, sometimes hungry and dirty, suffering horribly and dying at the hands of somebody else. Read again with me verse 24. Jesus told his disciples, these are his students, these are his followers, the ones who are currently traveling with him, anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. John phrases it this way over in 1 John chapter 2. There in verse 6, whoever <coughs> says he abides in him, meaning God, walk in the same way in which may never be that we get to the point of Jeremiah. Our list of tragedies may never extend to the full list of Paul's. We may make it well past 33 or 35 and never have to die on the cross. We may never get to the point where we become extremely wealthy and that wealth is the thing that we have to get rid of completely. But if it falls, As a little kid, a lot of jobs seem really romantic. A lot of a lot of adventures seem romantic. A lot of kids dream of, of, of being sailors or, or treasure hunters or pirates growing up. And that sounds really romantic until you get on the boat. And you gotta scrub deck the whole time. And you have weeks and weeks of no wind. And you have to eat salt pork and gruel. I mean, that romance goes away quickly. And sometimes that's how discipleship is. It is really romantic looking on the outside. I want to be like Paul. I want to be like Peter. I want to be like Jesus. Jeremiah would be great to be like. But sometimes that romance wears out really quickly. And we find the way to try to be the disciple without actually being doing the disciple things. I have all the benefits and all the blessings. I want to have the character and the personality of a disciple but I don't want to be like them. I, I want to be the sailor with all the all the cool tattoos and all the great stories, but I want to I want to be on the boat. And that's so oftentimes how I treat being a disciple. I'm not willing to give up the thing that's closest to my heart, like the rich young ruler. I don't want to have to suffer the really, 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 really down times like Jeremiah. I don't want to be someone who has the relationship with God from time to time where I have to beat my chest and just beg him to be merciful to me as a sinner. I want to, I want to meet him as equals. I want to bargain with him and justify myself before him. I want to be like Paul, but I want to be nothing like Paul in my life. I don't want to have to, to be beaten and shipwrecked and stoned. I, want to, I don't want to have to be run out of town and be let out by a basket out of the city wall. I don't want to have to go through any of those things, but I want to have his character. 
I want to claim to be a disciple of Jesus, but I don't want to be willing to pay that price. But that's the exact point that Jesus makes in Matthew 16. If you would follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Wherever that leads. We are called to count the cost. And there's always going to be a cost. But with the cost always comes something in return. We're going to be talking about that next week. With the hand that God gives away, he usually returns something else. And whatever cost that you have to give up, it's going to be worth it. That's why Jeremiah suffered through the things that he suffered. Because it was worth it. That's the reason that the tax collector had to beat his chest. And beg God to be merciful because it was going to be worth it. The reason to hold up the next day after being beaten and thought, okay, it might happen again today. Because it was worth it. And when Jesus looked at the crowds and he had compassion, and he went to the cross anyways, it's because you were worth it. When it comes to discipleship, we need to understand that whatever sacrifice, and there's going to be sacrifices, they're going to be worth it. And to look at the people of the Bible and say, I want their character, and I want their actions, and I want their attitudes, and I want their heart, and sometimes you've got to pay the same price that they have to pay. And it's still going to be worth it. If you will open your song list number 620. When Jesus presented the gospel, we mentioned this back in Matthew chapter 5 as we were going through that the last few weeks, he gave them the cost up front. Blessed are you when they persecute you, when they find you out and evil against you. First nine phrases inside the gospel is that's going to be a possibility. But he also adds the fact that yours will be the kingdom of heaven, and that you will be comforted that you'll be called sons of God. And that makes it all work. And if you're here today, and that isn't your reward yet, because you haven't taken on those qualities yet, let us know as we stand in sitting number 620. <clears throat> Would you live for Jesus and be always true? Would you walk with him?